the end of December in 1984, in a little village in northern India, a young woman named Sumitra had her first child with her husband. And right away, Sumitra fell in love with her little baby boy. She had always wanted a baby, and now that she had one, she carried him with her everywhere, strapped to her chest. And any time she had a free hand from cooking or housework, she would use it to pat his head or tickle his feet. Life was not easy for anyone in Sumitra's village, which was located just south of the Himalayan mountains along the Ganges River. Sumitra's village was very poor. People lived in mud huts with thatched roofs, they had no electricity, and basically no one had any formal education. As for Sumitra, her life was especially challenging even relative to her peers, because when she was very young, her mother died, and then her father had to go away all the time for work, and so she was left alone a lot and basically was raised by a cousin. And now, even though she was married, her husband also had to travel quite a bit for work. And so Sumitra, she lived with her husband's parents in their hut, but the reality was is she wasn't nearly as close with them as she was with her own family, and her own family was nowhere nearby. And so Sumitra's life was really quite lonely, even as an adult. And so when Sumitra had her baby, it was like for the first time in her life, she didn't feel alone and she she was excited about her life. She was happy that something was finally going the way she wanted it to. But then, one day in early 1985, everything changed. That day, Sumitra, with her son attached to her chest, was walking into town to get water from the well. And as she was walking along the dirt path, she suddenly came to a stop, very rigid, and she dropped her bucket on the ground. A couple of other villagers who were nearby heard the bucket fall. They turned and looked at Sumitra, who was standing there totally rigid. And so one of these villagers, who was very concerned, walked over to Sumitra and asked her what was going on. But Sumitra, she didn't say anything. She just stood there frozen. And this concerned villager looked down at Sumitra Sumitra's hands and her fingers were bending back so hard it almost looked like they might break going in the other direction. And then this villager, before asking any more questions, looked up at Sumitra's face and her eyes had rolled back into the back of her skull and she had begun grinding her teeth so hard that it was making this loud cracking sound with every movement of her jaw side to side. And so this villager was totally terrified and backed up for a second and right as they did, Sumitra's baby, who was still strapped to Sumitra's chest began hysterically crying. And so the combination of Sumitra's baby crying and these other couple of villagers who were staring at Sumitra, who's standing there in this very grotesque pose, attracted the eyes of other nearby villagers. And soon there was a crowd of people just standing there looking at Sumitra, not sure what to do. And then just as suddenly as Sumitra had fallen into this trance, it stopped and Sumitra, she kind of shook her head, she fluttered her eyes and she looked around and then suddenly became aware that her son is hysterically crying and also there's this crowd of people all around her. She has no idea why. And so feeling really embarrassed, but again, not knowing what's going on, Sumitra quickly picked up her water bucket. She held her son and hustled out of the crowd of people and made her way into town where she would get water. When Sumitra came back from the well and was back near her hut, she didn't tell anyone about what had happened on the way to the well. Frankly, she couldn't really remember what happened. And so Sumitra told herself that whatever happened on the trail to the well, that trance she fell into, it had to be a one-time thing, likely brought on by stress and sleeplessness from having a new baby. But a few weeks later, it happened again, and this time the trance lasted quite a bit longer. Sumitra's father-in-law had walked into their kitchen and found Sumitra standing there totally rigid with her hands kind of bending backwards and her eyes rolled back in her skull. And he would tell her later on that he had shaken her and tried to wake her up, but he couldn't for almost 10 minutes. And then when she had snapped out of it, she had no memory and had no idea what happened. By May of 1985, so roughly five months after her first trance, Sumitra was falling into these bizarre spells nearly every day, and they were lasting hours at a time. And even more bizarre, lately, during Sumitra's trances, she would begin to speak, and the things she said were totally strange. Typically, she would bark out cries for help. She would say her head was being crushed, and someone needed to help her. And then suddenly, her voice would drop down to a whisper, and she would say, all I can see is darkness. Sumitra's family would contact the local medicine man, who would come out and examine Sumitra, but he couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. Besides 
besides her trances, there seemed to be absolutely nothing wrong with her. She was the picture of good health. And then on July 16th, 1985, so roughly six months into these trances, Sumitra would fall into another trance while she was cooking. And during this trance, she would speak. Except when she spoke, she was very calm. And she just said, in three days, I'm going to die. By this point, Sumitra was terrified of whatever was happening to her, and she was totally exhausted, and so was her family. Sumitra had stopped caring for her son, who was now about eight months old, because she was afraid that at any moment she could fall into a trance and accidentally hurt him. And so her mother-in-law had basically become the boy's mother, and also Sumitra's husband, who was the primary breadwinner for the family, was forced to stop traveling for work and just stay home and help out with Sumitra and his son. Finally, on July 19th, 1985, so this was the day that in her trance, Sumitra had predicted she would die. On that day, Sumitra woke up and made a very conscious effort not to do anything that could potentially harm her. She didn't cook because she didn't want to be near flames. She didn't walk near anything with any sort of ledge she could fall off. She didn't even walk downstairs for the same reason. She also kept a very safe distance from her son in order to make sure he was safe. And by late afternoon that day, Sumitra was just fine and there was no sign that anything bad was going to happen to her. And so she and her family began to relax. As Sumitra's mother-in-law began making dinner, Sumitra decided to go outside and get some fresh air. And when she got out there, she saw one of her close friends across the road, and so she waved to her. And as her friend cheerfully began walking closer to Sumitra to say hello, Sumitra suddenly froze, her eyes went back in her skull, her hands became rigid, and she fell into one of her trances. And so this friend, like everyone else in the village, had become quite accustomed to seeing Sumitra in the these trances. And so really, the friend was not that concerned when she saw Sumitra doing this. But then Sumitra began doing something in her trance that this friend had never seen before. Sumitra, who normally had her hands by her side during these trances, she began raising her hands up till they reached her forehead. And then wildly, Sumitra began clawing at something right above her head. And as she did, her breathing became very loud and labored. And so this friend, feeling suddenly so concerned for Sumitra, rushed over, but when she got right next to Sumitra, there was nothing she could do. Sumitra was just clawing at the sky, breathing really heavily, and then suddenly Sumitra stopped, and she put her hands down by her side, and she went back to this rigid pose, and then out of Sumitra's mouth came this horrible, low, rattling moan sound. It was just a constant sound that came out of her, and it got deeper and deeper and deeper until Sumitra's voice kind of cracked, and then suddenly Sumitra went totally still. And when this happened, Sumitra's friend, who was right next to her, realized Sumitra, even though she was standing upright, she was not breathing at all. It was like she was a statue. And so this friend began screaming for help. And so Sumitra's in-laws and her husband and other villagers who heard this cry, they came running outside and they quickly circled around Sumitra. And then a few minutes later, the medicine man arrived. He broke through the circle, went right up to Sumitra and began checking her out. He checked her pulse. He checked her heartbeat. He kind of looked inside of her mouth, he looked in her eyes, and then after a minute, he stepped back and he just said, she's dead. Sumitra's husband fell to his knees, and Sumitra's mother-in-law, who was carrying Sumitra's son, began crying. All the while, Sumitra's body still remained totally upright and rigid in the middle of all these people, with her hands tight by her side and her eyes rolled back, and her face frozen in what looked like a silent scream. Eventually, the medicine man and Sumitra's father-in-law stepped forward and lowered Sumitra's frozen, rigid body onto the ground on her back, and they closed her eyes. There was no hospital to take Sumitra's body to or official to call about her death. And in this village at this time, it was very important for both religious and public health reasons to take care of the body very quickly. And what that looked like was the villagers would work together to perform the Hindu death rituals. And then afterwards, they would cremate the body, which is a process of burning the body until all you have left is the ashes. And so as Sumitra's body lay still rigid on her back right near her home, her family and the villagers began making preparations for her funeral. 
funeral. Sumitra's mother-in-law and some women from the village began scrubbing down Sumitra's body as well as putting essential oils on her face and other villagers who were not a part of that went off to find wood for a fire. The villagers weren't talking much and a lot of the women were crying but it wasn't just grief they were feeling, it was also fear. They all knew about Sumitra's trances, they happened all the time for months, but what the villagers couldn't wrap their heads around was the idea that during one of these trances, Sumitra had accurately predicted her own death. And so now the villagers couldn't help but think that dark forces were at play here, that maybe Sumitra was possessed, and you know, now whatever had possessed her and killed her is somewhere in the village. And so that night, as the sun started to go down, normally kids would be out playing in the village, but their parents said, no, come inside, it's not safe outside. And so for the most part, the only people who were outside that night were the women who were still cleaning and prepping Sumitra's body for her funeral. And at some point, one of the women who was doing this was brushing out Sumitra's hair. And as she did that, she suddenly stopped and she backed up and screamed and pointed at Sumitra. And then the other women all around Sumitra's body, they looked over at what this person was pointing at and they too saw it and screamed and everyone began scrambling to try to get away from Sumitra as fast as possible. What all these terrified women were seeing was that Sumitra, her eyes were closed, but her eyes were darting left and right, so her eyelids were kind of fluttering. And then suddenly Sumitra's chest filled with air, and then she breathed out a long, loud exhale, and then she opened her eyes, and she sat bolt upright and began looking around. And the other women who were terrified, they're looking at her, and they were struck by how completely healthy and normal Sumitra now looked, even though for the past 45 minutes, she didn't have a heartbeat and was totally pale and looked completely dead. Sumitra wiped the essential oils from her face and then she stood up and as she did, the medicine man, he had heard all the commotion and ran over and he ran to Sumitra and kind of assisted her and got her to stand on her feet because she was a little bit wobbly. And then the medicine man performed a checkup on Sumitra, checking her heartbeat, her pulse, he looked in her mouth, he looked at her eyes, and then he asked Sumitra, you know, how are you feeling? and Sumitra said, I'm okay. And then the medicine man, he kind of turned to face this now huge crowd of onlooking villagers, and the medicine man had a big smile on his face, and he said, you all have just witnessed a miracle. Sumitra is back from the dead. Sumitra's husband and her in-laws were too shocked to say anything or really even react. But then suddenly Sumitra's husband was overcome with joy and he ran forward to hug Sumitra. But as Sumitra turned and saw him coming towards her, she backed up suddenly and put her hands out to protect herself from her husband. And immediately the medicine man, he kind of stepped in between the husband and Sumitra and he patted the husband on the shoulder and said, you know, she's been through something very traumatic. You need to give her time and space to recover. And and everybody in the village who saw this happen, they were accustomed to whenever Sumitra fell into one of her trances, when she came out of them, she oftentimes was a little bit confused. And so they all just kind of assumed that this is what was happening, but on a bigger scale, you know, this is a really intense trance they've seen, but she's just confused, she'll be okay soon. And so the villagers dispersed and the medicine man assisted Sumitra back into her hut and he got her in her bed where she fell asleep. And then afterwards, the medicine man reassured Sumitra Sumitra's husband and her in-laws that Sumitra, when she woke up, she'd likely be just fine, but he would come by and he would do another thorough medical exam on her just to make sure. And the next morning when Sumitra woke up, she did seem a lot better. When she left her bedroom, she seemed far less confused than she had been the night before. But as soon as Sumitra saw her husband and her in-laws, she got so scared, she just bolted from her hut and started running away. And so the medicine man who had just come by to do his thorough check checkup, he saw her take off and so he began chasing her, as well as Sumitra's husband and father-in-law. They took off after Sumitra. And finally, when Sumitra's husband caught up to Sumitra, he grabbed her by the arm to stop her and Sumitra ripped her arm away from him and she said, how dare you touch another man's wife? And as the husband kind of ushered Sumitra back towards their house, she continued to say, you're not my family, this is not my home. And then finally, Sumitra's husband and the medicine man 
had to literally drag Sumitra to get her to go back inside the hut. And as they dragged her inside, she kept screaming that her name was Shiva Duetti and her in-laws had killed her. Over the next couple of days, the medicine man and Sumitra's family tried everything they could to try to snap her out of what seemed like a really long trance, but nothing they did worked. It seemed like Sumitra had just kind of lost her mind. Sumitra began refusing to touch her beloved son and instead would demand that someone bring her Rinku and Tinku. But when no one knew who or what she was talking about, Sumitra would just get furious. Sumitra had never gone to school and so did not know how to write. But now suddenly in this new trance that she was in, Sumitra would go inside of her bedroom and write these long, totally unhinged sounding letters to total strangers, asking them to come, please take her home. And when she wasn't doing that, she was typically outside in the courtyard, looking at a scar on her foot, wondering how she got it. Sumitra also began wrapping her sari, which is a type of dress fabric, in a new and strange way around her head. She also refused to eat off of any dishes that her family had previously used, and her voice began to sound different. It was higher pitched and much faster, and the way she spoke was always so rude. And so eventually, Sumitra's husband and her in-laws and everybody in the village just kind of resigned themselves to the fact that when Sumitra had not had a heartbeat for 45 minutes when she died. During that time, she likely suffered serious brain damage, or at a minimum, when she kind of came back from the dead, she suffered some kind of psychological break. And so that was why she was acting the way she was. And soon, people just stopped trying to break Sumitra out of this trance she was in, and instead, they all focused on just trying to keep her from running away or hurting herself. And then one day, on October 20th, 1985, so three months after Sumitra had died for 45 minutes, Sumitra's family heard a knock on their front door. When Sumitra's husband went to the door and opened it up, he saw there was this older gentleman standing there wearing a suit and nice shoes, standing several feet back from the door, as if he was kind of shy, but felt compelled to knock on the door. Now, right off the bat, this man looked totally out of place to Sumitra's husband. Nobody in this village wore suits or nice shoes. In fact, most people, including Sumitra and her family, didn't even wear shoes. But even stranger than what this man was wearing was what he was clutching against his chest. He had this huge leather-bound book with gold trim around the edges that he was holding onto very tightly as if it was very important. And so finally, this strange man, who was visibly nervous and rocking back and forth, began to speak. But his voice was so low, Sumitra's husband had to lean forward just to hear him. The man said his name was Ram Tripathi, and he wanted to know if there was a young woman living in this home who had recently begun acting differently. Sumitra's husband had no idea who Ram Tripathi was. He didn't know this guy. He certainly didn't know where he came from. But what was going through his head was, how is this stranger who's dressed in a funny way, who's got this weird book, how is he aware of the issues my wife is having? And so after a long pause, Sumitra's husband just kind of looks Ram Tripathi up and down a couple of times and then says, wait right here, I'll be right back. And then Sumitra's husband turned around, he walked through the hut into Sumitra's bedroom, and kind of matter-of-factly, he said to Sumitra, who was sitting there writing another letter, that there's a strange man outside named Ram Tripathi, and he's asking about you. Sumitra's husband expected Sumitra to just turn and look at him with a blank stare, like she had been doing the last few days. But this time she turned and looked up at him with a huge smile on her face and then she leapt up and ran to the front door and leapt into the arms of Ram Tripathi. And Ram Tripathi, he was kind of taken aback, still holding his book, not really reacting to what Sumitra was doing. And at some point Sumitra leans in and whispers something into Ram Tripathi's ear and Ram Tripathi, he reacted to it very negatively. He kind of looked up at her and looked over at Sumitra's husband like something was wrong, but Sumitra's husband could couldn't tell what Sumitra had said, and so the whole situation made no sense to Sumitra's husband, and apparently it also made no sense to Ram Tripathi. And so pretty quickly, Ram Tripathi kind of pushed Sumitra off of him and took a few steps back and looked at Sumitra and said, what's your name? And Sumitra is now looking at Ram Tripathi with a look of anger and betrayal on her face, and she says, my name is Shiva Duetti. 
Ram Tripathi, after hearing this, did not respond and instead just kind of gestured over to a low wall just outside of their house for he and Sumitra to go sit down on. And so he walked over and Sumitra followed him, they sat down, and Sumitra's husband, he walked over, but he stayed a couple of feet back standing up. And once Ram Tripathi was sitting down, he lowered his big leather-bound book and he opened it up, and inside were all these photographs. And right away, Ram Tripathi pointed at one of the pictures, which contained a bunch of people in it, and he turned to Sumitra and he said, can you identify who's in this photo? And Sumitra, she looked at the photo and immediately began rattling off names that were all correct. These are people that Sumitra's husband, he's looked over and he's got no idea who the people are in that photo. And so after Sumitra correctly identifies that photo, Ram Tripathi turns the page, he picks out another photo and he says, can you identify who's in this photo? And again, Sumitra one by one would name correctly all the people in the photo. And then finally, Ram Tripathi took a sigh and he flipped the page one more time and he pointed to one particular picture which contained one person. And he looked at Sumitra and he said, do you know who this is? And Sumitra, she would look over at the photo and instead of immediately saying the name, she paused and she kind of began to breathe heavy and she seemed kind of angry. And then she looked at Ram Tripathi and she said, I know who that is. That's my sister-in-law. And she killed me by hitting me over the head with a brick. And at this, Ram Tripathi dropped his book on the ground and he turned and embraced Sumitra as hard and as intensely as she had when she had run out and leapt into his arms. And he and Sumitra, they hugged and cried for a long time. And then finally, when they separated, Ram Tripathi turned to Sumitra's husband, who's still just standing there totally bewildered, and he tells him, let's go inside and I'll explain everything. Once Ram Tripathi was inside with Sumitra and her family, he told them an unbelievable story about a woman named Shiva Duetti. Shiva Duetti was, of course, the name that Sumitra for months had been saying was her own. But over those few months, her family had just assumed that that name meant nothing and that what she was saying was nonsense because of her brain injury. But Ram Tripathi would tell them that Shiva Duetti was the name of a young woman who lived in a city none of them had had ever heard before, located about 60 miles away from their village. He would tell them that Shiva was a very wealthy woman who was college educated and she had two young sons. And it would turn out that Shiva's youngest child was born almost on the same day that Sumitra's child was born in December of 1984. But unlike Sumitra, who after the birth of her child felt like her life got so much better, she loved her family, she was excited about the future, for Shiva, it was the opposite. When her first child arrived, it was like her life got worse and worse and worse. Shiva's in-laws had grown to hate her. They didn't like that she was so well-educated and they hated the family she came from. And so by early 1985, when by this point, Sumitra was regularly falling into those trances with her eyes rolling back and her teeth gnashing, the tension and fighting in Shiva's home, 60 miles away, was reaching an almost unbearable level. Shiva began writing these long letters that she would send to her family far away, where she would detail waking up almost every night with nightmares screaming. And in May of 1985, which is when Sumitra began speaking during her trances, Shiva got into the biggest fight she had ever gotten into with her in-laws about attending a family wedding. And on the night of May 18th, 1985, Shiva's neighbors in her city saw Shiva's in-laws literally carrying Shiva's body, which appeared to be unconscious, as they walked along the railroad tracks. When these neighbors ran up and asked if everything was okay with Shiva, Shiva's in-laws just said, oh, you know, she's sick and we're taking her to the hospital. Now, it was nighttime, there were no lights around, and so it was really dark and these neighbors couldn't get a good look at Shiva to see, you know, what was going on with her. And so even though they thought this was very strange, they decided not to say anything. The next morning, Shiva's dead body was found lying on the train tracks right near the train station. And so someone raised the alarm and before long, Shiva's uncle and sister ran to the train station. And when they got there and saw Shiva on the tracks, they also saw Shiva's in-laws were already there. And when they spoke to Shiva's in-laws, they told the uncle and the sister that it looks like Shiva must have jumped in front of a train to commit suicide. But the uncle and sister are looking down at Shiva's body and there appeared to be really no markings, bruises, cuts of any kind on her body that you would expect from getting hit by a train, except Shiva did have a very big mark on her head. 
Later on, the uncle and sister would say it looked like something had bashed Shiva's head in. Shiva's in-laws would immediately cremate Shiva's body before Shiva's actual family could stop them, and the police in this area were not good at investigating crime. So when Shiva's in-laws went to them and said, yep, she jumped in front of a train, she committed suicide, but we don't have a body because we already cremated her, the police just accepted it. Shiva's father was convinced that Shiva had been murdered, but he didn't have a way to prove it until Sumitra appeared to die on July 19th, 1985, and then came back to life, claiming to be Shiva. Shiva's father had heard a rumor about some girl in a village 60 miles away claiming to be his dead daughter. Now, at first, Shiva's father did not believe this, but eventually he decided he would go to the village and test this girl to see if maybe it was true. And so on October 20th, 1985, Shiva's father put on his best suit and his nicest shoes. He brought his leather bound photo book and he headed to Sumitra's village and knocked on her hut. Ram Tripathi was Shiva's dad. When Sumitra at first ran outside and leapt onto Ram Tripathi and hugged him and then whispered something into his ear that Sumitra's husband saw happening but couldn't hear what she said, and then Ram Tripathi, when he heard what she whispered, he kind of recoiled and acted angry for a second. What Sumitra was saying was, Papa. In the moment, Ram Tripathi, who was not convinced Sumitra was his daughter, felt like this is a horrible, elaborate hoax, and it needs to stop. But then Sumitra correctly identified 15 people in his leather-bound photo album, including the sister-in-law who she said killed her. And even more convincing than that was that Sumitra knew how Shiva had been killed by getting smashed over the head with a brick. This was a question that Ram Tripathi had never heard the answer to before. And at that point, Ram Tripathi believed that this must be his daughter's reincarnated spirit inside of Sumitra. And so that was when he dropped the book and gave her a big hug. This story is considered to be one of the most credible reincarnation stories ever recorded. Scientists from the University of Virginia in America actually went to India to study Sumitra and interview everybody involved. And they concluded that this was not a hoax. They said that Sumitra had most likely either been possessed by or reincarnated as Shiva Duetti. The change in Sumitra's voice that her family noticed was the same accent that Shiva had. It was very urban and educated. The strange new way that Sumitra wrapped her sari on her head was the same way that Shiva did. Sumitra was rude to her family and refused to eat off the same dishes as them because she believed she was actually a very wealthy woman who was for some reason being forced to live in this poor person's hut. And when Sumitra asked for Tinku and Rinku, those were nicknames that Shiva had given her two sons. And all those seemingly unhinged letters that Sumitra had written and fired off to random strangers were in fact sent to various members of Shiva's family. After Shiva's father, Ram Tripathi, brought Sumitra's story to the police, the police would actually investigate this case and they would charge some members of Shiva's family. But ultimately, Sumitra's testimony was deemed unacceptable for court, and so the case was never officially solved. As for Shiva's in-laws, they have always denied killing her. Sumitra lived the entire rest of her life as Shiva, and Shiva's real parents accepted her as their daughter. Sumitra also came to accept her son and raised her son with her husband in their little village until she died in 1998. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to read the like button a bedtime story, but badly mispronounce every fourth word. Summer of 1930, Rafael Pansardi and his wife Leonarda Cianciulli moved with their four young kids to a little town in northern Italy called Correggio. A terrible earthquake had destroyed the family's previous village and killed nearly all of their neighbors. And so this family was feeling very lucky to be alive, but when they arrived in Correggio, they really had nothing and were hoping that, you know, the people of this town will just be very welcoming and generous and kind of help them get set up again. And the people of this town did exactly that. 
Correggio was this beautiful place inside of a fertile valley where people lived in these cottages surrounded by rice fields and mulberry trees. And the people who lived there were very tight knit and looked after each other and cooked for each other and had parties together. I mean, this was a real community. And so when Raphael and Leonardo arrived, the townspeople immediately found them this cute little cottage by a stream with a whitewashed front door and a beautiful stone hearth for cooking. And there was an attached storefront on this cottage that they were giving them. And then on top of that, once the family had moved in, the family's new neighbors helped get Raphael a job. And they also helped Leonardo set up the attached storefront that was part of their cottage so she could sell her homemade soap bars out of the shop. And so very quickly, the family just completely fell in love with Correggio, especially 36-year-old Leonardo. Losing her home and her previous neighbors in that terrible earthquake had been a tragedy on epic scale, but it was far from the first tragedy that Leonardo had been forced to live through. Leonardo had been born into poverty. Her mother had actually come from a very wealthy family, but they had cut Leonardo's mom off when she became pregnant with Leonardo. And so when Leonardo's mom gave birth to her, she blamed Leonardo for their poverty and all of their problems, and so beat her relentlessly. And then on top of that, Leonardo's father died when she was very young, and so she was stuck at home being abused constantly by her mother. When Leonardo was 21, she met Raphael and fell in love with him, and he was a very kind and gentle man. He really Really made a very strong first impression on anyone who met him. But when Leonardo went to her mother and introduced Raphael to her and said, I'm going to marry this man, I love him, her mother flew into a rage and then literally cursed Leonardo. She actually out loud muttered the spell and then told Leonardo that because of the spell, Leonardo would have evil following her forever. Now, of course, Leonardo was very used to her mother's terrible behavior, and so she did not actually think she was at risk of this curse affecting her life in any way. But not long after actually marrying Raphael, Leonardo began to see evidence that this curse might actually be real. It started with Leonardo having these sudden fits of seizures for no particular reason. And then Leonardo, every time she got pregnant, she would miscarry and lose the baby. And so feeling really sad and desperate because all she wanted was a family, Leonardo actually went to a fortune teller in hopes that they would tell her that in the future, her life got better, not worse, which to Leonardo meant, you know, the curse was not real if my life improves. But after this fortune teller took Leonardo's hands and studied her palms, she looked up at Leonardo and gave her grave news. She said, Leonardo, you're going to have living children, but they're all going to die young. And I see a prison and an insane asylum in your future. This experience totally shocked Leonardo and confirmed for her that her mother's curse must be real. And sure enough, over the following years, Leonardo and Raphael would go on to have 14 living children and 10 of them would die when they were babies or toddlers. And so by the time Leonardo had arrived in Correggio with her family in 1930, she was absolutely petrified that her last four precious children would die because of this curse. And so in order to keep her kids safe, she basically never let them out of her sight. And then she also made sure they always adhered to these strange rules and beliefs that Leonardo had come up with about good and evil that were designed to somehow protect the kids from this curse. But the incredible show of generosity and support and kindness that Leonardo and her family had experienced when they arrived in Correggio had really done something to Leonardo. In fact, it really kind of changed the way she viewed the world. Suddenly, she was less concerned with this curse and how to protect her family from it. And instead, she was just kind of content. She felt safe. She felt happy. The women in the town loved Leonardo and always came by the house to say hi to her and eat some of the amazing tea cakes that she would make. And also Leonardo had become best friends with this woman named Virginia, who was a former opera singer from Milan, who was very elegant and beautiful. And every time she went to a dinner party, she would invite Leonardo. And also Leonardo and her family were becoming financially stable really for the first time ever. Leonardo's soap shop that she ran out of their cottage was really successful. People came 
came from all around to buy her soaps because nobody could make them like she could. And Raphael's job as a clerk was very steady, and he too was becoming well-respected in town. And so because of how well this transition to Correggio had been, at some point, Leonardo made a promise both to herself and to the universe that instead of focusing all of her time and energy on this curse, which had plagued her her whole life, instead, she was going to focus on helping the people of Correggio any way she could because they had done so much for her. And that is exactly what Leonardo did, but in a kind of ironic way. Because of the fear Leonardo had for her mother's curse, she had gone to that fortune teller many years ago. And even though the news she got when she saw the fortune teller was horrible, Leonardo had left that experience kind of fascinated with the art of fortune telling and magic and sorcery. It just really appealed to her. And so now that Leonardo was running this very successful soap shop out of her house, there were all these people coming from far and wide that would ask to barter for her soaps. Bartering is like trading one item for another item versus paying for something outright with money. And so Leonardo began bartering with these travelers whenever they had books about fortune telling, about magic, about sorcery, about how to make potions, about the occult. And after reading through all of these books and learning as much as she could, Leonardo, in addition to selling her soaps, began offering fortune-telling services to the people of Correggio. And it would turn out she was really good at predicting the future, to the point where people in town basically began going to her for all kinds of advice. She helped women find love, she told farmers what crops to plant, she created these charm bags for people and told them they would protect them, she also began creating these herb potions for people when they got sick. It actually got to the point where people People trusted her so much that when they got sick, they didn't even go to the doctor. They just went to her. And so very quickly, Leonardo felt very proud of the fact that she had lived up to the promise she had made both to herself and to the universe to always help the people of Correggio at every turn. But more than that, Leonardo was starting to think that this newfound sense of purpose and happiness she was getting in helping the people of Correggio through her various services had finally broken her mother's curse. By 1939, Leonardo and her family had been living in Correggio very happily for almost 10 years, and at the time, Leonardo's oldest son, Giuseppe, was 17 years old. Giuseppe was tall, he was handsome, he had dark hair, he had dark eyes, and all the girls loved him. And Giuseppe and Leonardo had always had a very close relationship. Every day, Giuseppe would come home, and he and his mom would sit in the kitchen, and they would chat for a while and eat some of her tea cakes. But now, in 1939, when Giuseppe was 17, he started to act a little bit different. He would come home, and instead of going into the kitchen to sit with Leonardo, he would just go straight to his room and shut the door. And when Leonardo or Raphael would ask him, you know, hey, is everything okay? Giuseppe would get very defensive and say he was fine and to please just leave me alone. But to Leonardo, it seemed really obvious that her son was not fine, and she thought, you know, maybe he has some sort of secret he's keeping, and that's what's making him act this way. He's hurting on the inside, but he can't share it with the world. But Leonardo had no idea what this secret might be. And then one day, late that same year, Leonardo was walking through town when one of her neighbors came up to her and said, hey, are you aware that your son Giuseppe has signed up for the military and he's leaving for training in just a few months? Leonardo had not heard about this. People were talking a lot about World War II, which had just started around this time, but Leonardo had never considered that her precious son would go off to fight in that war. But now, Leonardo realized that Giuseppe's recent strange behavior suddenly made sense. This was the secret he was keeping. He had joined the military, and he hadn't told his family. Leonardo turned around and went straight home. She went right into her bedroom, shut the door, and she just sobbed. To her, it felt like her mother's curse was back, and now her precious son was going to go off into the war and he was going to die, unless she found a way to combat this evil that was now following her again. For the next several days, Leonardo did not open up her soap shop, she didn't come downstairs, she just stayed locked in her bedroom and read through all of her books about magic and sorcery and the occult, looking for some sort of solution for how to fight this curse. 
And finally, she figured out what she had to do. She read that if she gave something beautiful to the universe, the universe would reward her. And in Leonardo's mind, that reward would be sparing her son. And so Leonardo decided that the most beautiful thing she could offer the universe would be to help the people of Correggio, which she was already doing, but in her mind, she thought she could really ramp up her efforts and really try to change people's lives. And she thought if she could do that, the universe was sure to notice and it would save her son's life. Leonardo decided that the first person she would really go above and beyond to help inside of Correggio was a woman named Faustina. Faustina, who was in her 70s, was desperate to get married, but to many people in town, including Leonardo, she seemed kind of beyond help. She was totally antisocial, she was awkward, and just kind of given her age, it seemed like marriage was just not in the cards for her. But this is where Leonardo thought she could step in and change everything for Faustina. She would find her a husband. So Leonardo reached out to Faustina and told her about a friend of hers, a man who lived in a city to the north, who was also alone in his old age and who was likely looking for marriage, and she could set them up if Faustina was interested. And so Faustina was immediately interested and wanted to meet this guy, but Leonardo did tell her that, you know, this guy, the reason he's not married is... It's kind of difficult to be around. He's kind of a jerk, but he's got a wonderful heart. He means well. I think he'd be a great fit for you. And so again, Faustina's like, great, I want to meet him. I want to marry him. I'm ready. And then finally, the day came when Faustina actually went to this other town and met this guy in person, and they fell in love. And Faustina just moved right in with him. And before long, she was sending happy postcards back to Correggio, telling everyone about how happy she was and how thankful she was for Leonardo's help in setting them up. And so Leonardo was obviously thrilled, not only for her friend's happiness, but also it really felt like she had checked the box in terms of really going above and beyond to help someone in Correggio in an effort to get the universe to spare her son. But her son was still a couple months away from leaving for training, and Leonardo, she's very superstitious, and she's thinking, okay, I don't know if that was enough to get the universe to save my son, and so I need to find somebody else I can help. So, in September of 1940, Leonardo began her next good deed project with another woman in town. She was a widow in her 50s named Francesca. She had worked as a teacher, but when her husband got sick, she quit her job, and then when her husband ultimately died, she was left with nothing. So, Leonardo reached out to Francesca and told her that she, Leonardo, would be willing to reach out to her own mother's rich family to see if maybe they had a job they could finesse for Francesca. Now, of course, Leonardo was not excited about talking to her mother's family who had disowned her mother and had shown no interest in Leonardo, but Leonardo wanted to do this for Francesca and for the sake of her son and getting the universe to notice what she was doing, and so sure enough, Leonardo would reach out to her mother's family, and they were remarkably open to the idea, and they got a job for Francesca in Switzerland. And so eventually, Francesca jetted off to Switzerland, and then a couple of days later, she was sending postcards back to Correggio, saying how happy she was and how thankful she was for Leonardo's help. And so again, Leonardo was so happy about this outcome, both because she cared about Francesca and also because this was yet another kind of check in the box of her good deeds that the universe was going to notice that in turn would save her son. But again, after Francesca didn't need any more help, Leonardo found herself looking at her son who was getting closer and closer to leaving for training and she would think to herself, have I done enough to protect him? Have I really stopped this curse from killing him after he leaves? And Leonardo eventually decided that no, she had not done enough. She needed to do at least one more really big good deed for someone in this town. And who better to help than her best friend, Virginia, the former opera singer? Leonardo knew from all her talks with Virginia that Virginia really missed living in the big city and going to the opera house. And so Leonardo reached out to Virginia and said, you know what, I can reach out to my mother's rich family and maybe they can find a job for you in a big city if you're interested. And so Virginia was like, wow, yes, I would love that. That's an amazing opportunity. 
And so Leonarda again would contact her mother's rich family, and again they came through, finding this job as a social planner for this very rich guy in Florence, Italy, who often funded plays and operas. And so this job was perfect for Virginia. When Leonarda told Virginia about this opportunity, Virginia cried tears of joy. After packing up all of her things, Virginia made a stop at Leonardo's house to say goodbye and thank you. And the two women would hug and laugh and cry. They would drink wine together. And then finally, when it was time for Virginia to go, even though Leonardo was very sad, she was also quite happy because finally she felt like this good deed was enough to get the universe to spare her son. However, Leonardo, being a very superstitious person, did have one more little thing she wanted to to do with Giuseppe before he left for the military. And this little thing was her, Leonardo, bathing her son, her 18-year-old son, with a particular bar of soap, and then she also wanted to feed him a special kind of tea cake that she was going to make. The soap and the tea cake had these special herbs and ingredients and different things she had pulled from her books of magic and the occult, and they would kind of form like a protective barrier both outside and inside of Giuseppe. So on the same night that Virginia headed off to Florence, when Giuseppe came home, Leonardo approached him and said, I want to give you this bath and I want to feed you these tea cakes. And Giuseppe was not remotely enthused at the idea of having his mom bathe him. He's 18. But he knew she was highly superstitious, she seemed pretty emotional about this, and it just seemed like it was extremely important to her. And so he said, okay. And so Leonardo washed her son with this special kind of magic soap, and then she also gave him the tea cakes. And then afterward, even though Giuseppe was really annoyed by what he had just been asked to do, Leonardo was so happy she was practically floating. She felt like she had done everything she could possibly do, and now she could just relax because her son was safe. But soon, Leonardo would learn that that was not actually true. A few days after giving her son the magical last bath and magical tea cakes, the police showed up at the front door of Leonardo's house. And when she opened the door and saw the police, she asked what was going on. And the police would say to her, hey, the three women that you supposedly helped that left town recently, they've all been reported missing by their families. They don't know where they are. And so Leonardo, she was totally shocked by this. And she said, no, that's that's not possible. I write to them all the time. I, I get postcards that come in very regularly from all of them. And then Leonardo went and got the postcards and showed the police, like, look, I'm talking to them. How could they possibly be missing? And so the police, they would look at these letters and they would agree with Leonardo that it is pretty strange that she'd be getting these very authentic seeming letters from these women if these women were also missing. And so eventually the police would leave and they would tell Leonardo that they they would be in touch if they needed anything. And then over the next couple of days, Leonardo was very concerned about these three women, but she received numerous postcards from these women over those several days, and all of these postcards were totally normal seeming. And so Leonardo was fairly confident that whatever was going on with the police had to have been a mix up and she wouldn't be hearing from them again. But a couple of weeks later, the police did come back to Leonardo's house, except this time they didn't knock, they just barged right in. After the police had spoken with Leonardo that first time, they did some digging on these letters that she was receiving, and they managed to trace them all back to their start point. And it turned out all of these letters from all three of these women were originating from one place. It was this little town to the north of Correggio. And when police went to this little town, they discovered that these letters that were starting in this little town were all being mailed by the same person and they got a physical description of this person who apparently was pretending to be these three women. And the description was of a tall, handsome young man with dark hair and dark eyes. It was Giuseppe. After the police barged into Leonardo's house, they went straight to Giuseppe's room where they accused him of murdering those three women. And then they hauled him out of the house and brought him to the station to question him about where he dumped the bodies. When the last police officer left Leonardo's house, Leonardo walked outside and just stood there wondering what she was going to do. It was like she had done everything in her power to protect her son from this curse, but somehow this curse she knew had done this 
this to her son. And so now she knew there was only one thing she could do. Without saying anything to her husband, she went inside, she got her things, and she began making her way to the police station. At this point in her life, Leonarda looked much older than her actual age of 46. She had very gray hair, her face was very wrinkled, and she was stooped over, and she was always carrying these charm bags and magical potions and little stick figures that she claimed protected her family. And so her overall appearance when she wandered into the police station was that of a very frail old woman who was also very strange. And so Leonarda hobbled her way up to the front desk and in a trembling voice, she asked the attendant if she could speak to the detective who was working on her son's case. And then a moment later, she was led into an interview room where she was told to wait. And then a little while later, the lead detective walked into the room. He sat down across the table from Leonardo and he said, what can I do for you? And immediately Leonardo said, my son Giuseppe is innocent. And the detective, when he heard this, he was not remotely surprised. In fact, this is fully what he expected this conversation was going to be. He knew Leonardo loved her son very much, and of course she was going to say he was innocent. This is what parents typically did in cases like this. But the detective decided he wouldn't try to stop her. He would just let this very distraught mother kind of talk for a bit. He would tell her that he would follow up on whatever she was saying, and then he would drive her back home. But this detective was not expecting the things that would come out of Leonardo's mouth over the next couple of hours. In fact, her story about why Giuseppe was innocent was so shocking and so bizarre that the detective outright said, I don't believe you. I don't believe this. This can't be true. And then other officers were called in to listen to her story to see if they believed it. And they too said, this doesn't seem real. But the police would follow up on the details she gave, and it all checked out. It would turn out, back in late 1939, on the day that Faustina, the first woman that Leonardo pledged to help in order to get the universe to save her son, when Faustina was set to go north and meet her future husband, Faustina stopped by Leonardo's house to say bye. And when she was in Leonardo's house, something very unexpected happened. When Faustina walked into Leonardo's kitchen where Leonardo was, Faustina was so excited about meeting her potential future husband that her hands were shaking and she was smiling ear to ear. And so Leonardo said to Faustina, hey, you need to calm down. And so she handed Faustina a glass of wine. And so Faustina took the wine and she had a couple of sips of wine and right away Faustina started feeling dizzy and before long she was grabbing the table just to keep from falling over. It would turn out the wine was poisoned by Leonardo and so Faustina she's kind of looking up at Leonardo and Leonardo is looking down at her and she's got an axe in one of her hands and she says to Faustina I'm so sorry. And then she winds up and she strikes Faustina in the chest with the axe and lodges it in her chest. And so she lets go of it, expecting Faustina to die. She doesn't. Faustina's just standing there with an axe in her chest. And so Leonardo grabbed the handle of the axe. She pulled it out of her chest and then began wailing on her head over and over and over again until Faustina did fall to the ground dead. Then Leonardo lit a fire under her big metal pot on the stove, and then she cut Faustina's body into nine pieces. She drained the blood out of the body into a bucket, and then she chucked those nine pieces into the pot on the stove and began to mix them with caustic soda, which is a powerful dissolving agent that's used to make soap. And then she boiled the ingredients, her body parts and this caustic soda, for hours. Faustina's body slowly turned into this horrible black mush inside of this pot and Leonardo was watching this the whole time and she just had a look of total disappointment as this was happening and then at some point she just took the pot off the stove and dumped the ingredients Faustina's body down the septic tank and then Leonardo waited for Faustina's blood that she had dumped out to coagulate which means it became semi-solid and then she heated it up in the oven and then ground it into flour and she would use that flour to make 
tea cakes, which she fed to her friends the next day, as well as her son, Giuseppe. Leonardo also asked her son to mail some letters for her from the little town to the north where Faustina had supposedly gone. These letters, of course, were written by Leonardo pretending to be Faustina to give the impression that she was still alive and well. And Giuseppe, when he was told to go mail these letters, didn't think anything of it. He was used to doing errands for his mom. Even though Leonardo basically got away with killing Faustina, her plan for Faustina had not really gone the way Leonardo had hoped. When she boiled Faustina's chopped up body parts and this caustic soda, they didn't really mix the way she wanted them to. Leonardo was convinced that the reason for this is because Faustina was too skinny, and so there wasn't enough fat on her body for the mix to be perfect. So, Leonardo had come up with another elaborate story, this time for another woman, Francesca, about that job in Switzerland she got through her mother's rich family. Of course, none of that was true, and when Francesca came by Leonardo's house to say goodbye to her, she was offered a glass of poisoned wine, and after she sipped from it, she became dizzy, and then Leonardo showed up with an axe and hacked Francesca to death. But again, when the body parts and the caustic soda were in the pot on the stove boiling together, they were still not coming together the way Leonardo wanted. And so again, Leonardo, with a look of disgust, just dumped the pot down the septic tank and wound up making tea cakes from Francesca's blood. Then the next day, she fed those tea cakes to her friends, as well as Giuseppe, and she also asked Giuseppe to send a few more letters from up north. These letters were, of course, from Francesca. Still feeling totally unsatisfied with how the last two killings had gone, Leonardo moved on to her third target, her best friend, Virginia. And this time, when Virginia came by Leonardo's house to say goodbye, everything went to plan. Leonardo was able to poison Virginia, she killed her with the axe, she chopped her up, she put her in the pot, and this time, the nine chunks of her body mixed beautifully with the caustic soda. And so after adding a few fine perfumes into the pot, Leonardo was finally able to create the thing that she had not been able to create with the other two women's bodies. And that was a beautiful, rich, creamy bar of soap. She also, again, made tea cakes from Virginia's blood. That night, when Giuseppe came home, Leonardo demanded that she be allowed to bathe him with her magic soap, i.e. the soap made from Virginia's body. And so she did that. She scrubbed him with Virginia's body soap. And then while she was doing that, she fed him the tea cakes that were made from Virginia's blood. It would turn out Leonardo did in fact believe that in order to save her son from this curse, she would need to give something beautiful to the universe. And at first, she really had believed that the way to do that was by helping the people of Correggio above and beyond anything she had ever done before. But at some point during her interactions with Faustina, the first woman, Leonardo had decided that, you know what, that wasn't enough. She really needed to make sure that her son was going to be safe. And so the only way really that Leonardo could guarantee her son would be safe would be if she actually took a life and gave that back to the universe. That would save her son. The reason Leonardo wound up taking three lives and not just one life is because she also decided that as an extra protective measure, she wanted to make sure that she actually bathed her son, literally, in the body parts and kind of essence of the life she had taken. And so that's where the idea of the soap came in. However, the first two women, their body parts didn't mix right, and so she couldn't turn them into soap. But then Virginia came along, and her body did mix with the caustic soda, and so Leonardo was able to make her soap. She was able to bathe her son with Virginia's body and feed him Virginia's blood. And so in Leonardo's mind, she had done everything she could to protect her son at that point. Leonardo would ultimately be sentenced to 30 years in prison, as well as three years in an insane asylum, just as the fortune teller had predicted. Leonardo died in 1970 when she was 76 years old. As for her family, they fled Correggio, and three of her children changed their names and vanished. And her prized son, Giuseppe, who she had killed to protect, had gone on to join the military and he would go to war, and he either was killed in combat or simply changed his name and vanished as well. 
So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please go in to the like button sleeping playlist and change the fourth song to the loudest death metal music you can find. On the morning of August 1st, 2009, 44-year-old skydiving instructor David Hartsock pulled into the parking lot of Skydive Houston in Texas and then made his way inside. A few minutes later, and Dave, like the rest of his colleagues, was hard at work getting ready for the day before the facility opened up and the inevitable weekend rush began. Skydive Houston is actually just a private airport, and it's not really in Houston. It's located about 30 miles to the northwest of Houston in a city called Waller. The main facility of Skydive Houston is situated right up against this huge open airfield that basically looks like a big green grass field. And the main facility itself is comprised of several large buildings, one of which is a huge hangar that contains the Super Twin Otter airplanes, which are the little aircraft that bring the skydivers up so they can jump out. Because Skydive Houston offers something called tandem jumping, it gets a lot of first-time jumpers. Tandem jumping is when a skydiving student attaches to the front of their instructor, literally they're buckled onto them, and then the two of them leap out of the plane together with the student never detaching from the instructor. This method allows the student to just kind of go along for the ride and have no responsibility, while the instructor who's attached to them does everything. They make sure they're both stable in the air, they're the ones that pull the ripcord to deploy the chute, they're the ones that land them safely on the ground. And so obviously, tandem jumping really appeals to first-time jumpers. Dave had finished his three-year-long training course to become a certified skydiving instructor just a few months earlier, but even prior to going through this course, Dave was already a very experienced skydiver with over 800 jumps to his credit. And the reason he had so many jumps is because Dave loved skydiving. It had given his life a focus that really nothing else ever had. Dave had always been a kind of average guy. He lived in a very modest house in a suburb of Houston, and for much of his life, he had worked very normal blue-collar jobs, like he had been a cook at two different chain restaurants, he had managed a grocery store, and he also had worked at a soda bottling plant. Dave was divorced and had no kids, but he had a really good group of friends who liked to go to bars and go bowling and play darts. And while Dave was never really unhappy with the way his life was going, as he started to creep into his 40s, he couldn't help but think, you know, I haven't really done anything big or important in my life. And so in 2004, not long after Dave got divorced, one of his good friends asked him if he wanted to go skydiving with him to celebrate that friend's 40th birthday. And Dave immediately thought to himself, this is it. This is a chance to do something big with my life. And so he told the friend, yes, I'd love to go. And after that first jump that Dave did with his friend, Dave was hooked. Whenever Dave was falling through the sky at over 100 miles per hour, it was like nothing else in the whole world even existed. Life became very simple and beautiful. The manager at Skydive Houston saw Dave come in every weekend for years to do all these jumps, and finally, he just offered Dave a job. And so that was how Dave left the soda bottling plant to become a skydiving instructor. So, August 1st, 2009 was a Saturday, and Saturdays at Skydive Houston were incredibly busy with basically non-stop tandem jumps all day. Whenever Dave was not working, so he was jumping on his own, he would always pack his own parachute because, like many other skydivers, he liked to make sure it was done exactly right. But when Dave was working, especially on Saturdays when it was so crazy busy, he didn't have time to pack and repack his parachute after every single jump because he was constantly being sent up again and again and again to take another student. And so instead, he would take one of the pre-packed parachutes that were left out for instructors inside of their clubhouse. That particular Saturday in August of 2009 went very quickly, with Dave going up one after another with different students and jumping out and pulling the chute and landing safely over and over again. And then finally, at the end of the day, right around four o'clock, when Dave was getting ready to be done for the day, his manager came up to him and said, hey, do you mind doing one more tandem jump? And even though Dave was really exhausted, he's dripping sweat, it's super hot outside, he'd done six jumps that day, which was a lot, he said, no problem. 
And so the manager introduced Dave to a short blonde woman who was visibly nervous named Shirley Diggert, who was there to celebrate her 54th birthday by skydiving for the first time. Her husband, her son, and her three grandkids were also there to watch her from the ground and take pictures. And her other son, who was celebrating his 30th birthday, he too was going skydiving. As soon as Dave walked up to Shirley, he grinned and stuck out his hand, and he made the same kind of corny joke he always made with nervous first-time jumpers, and that was, don't worry, you're going to be just fine, you're going to be strapped to me, and I'm not about to let anything happen to myself. And so Shirley laughed, and she did seem like she was a little bit at ease, and so Dave patted her on the shoulder, and then he walked over and he grabbed one of the pre-packed parachutes off the wall. These chutes actually contained two parachutes inside of the backpack. There was the main chute, which typically is the only chute that gets deployed on a jump, and then there was the reserve chute, which is a little bit smaller and is not normally used unless there's some sort of emergency where the main chute fails. After every jump, because the main chute has been deployed, it gets repacked and stuffed back into the backpack. But the reserve chute, because it almost never gets deployed, just stays packed. And so Skydive Houston, like basically every other skydiving facility, has certified technicians come in periodically to test the reserve chutes inside of the bag to make sure they're still packed exactly right. After grabbing the pre-packed parachute off the wall, Dave walked back over to Shirley, who was now in the staging area, putting on her flight suit. A flight suit is a single garment. It kind of looks like a big onesie for an adult. And so Dave walked over, he put the parachute down, he tugged and pulled on her flight suit to make sure it was good. And then after he was satisfied, he picked the parachute back up and he signaled to Shirley, as well as Shirley's son, who was also skydiving, to follow him. And so the trio, they left the staging area, they went outside right to the airfield where there was a super twin otter idling and other jumpers were climbing on board to go for a jump. And so Dave, Shirley, and Shirley's son got in line, they boarded the plane, and a few minutes later, they were airborne. As the plane slowly climbed up to 13,500 feet, which is the jumping altitude, Shirley was sitting directly in front of Dave. They were on a bench seat on the back right of this little airplane. And Dave made a point of talking to Shirley and asking her where she was from and what she did to kind of ease her nerves. Shirley would tell Dave that this was not the kind of thing that she typically did. In fact, she told Dave that her other son who was jumping with them, when he first decided he wanted to try skydiving a year earlier, she had desperately tried to talk him out of it, saying it was too dangerous. But recently, Shirley and her husband had decided that they needed to be more adventurous. They lived in a quiet town in rural Texas where Shirley was a mail carrier and her husband worked in a mine and their lives were just kind of simple and very routine oriented and kind of boring. So when Shirley's son, who was skydiving with them that day, had asked Shirley to go skydiving on her 54th birthday, she saw it as an opportunity to break the mold and do something adventurous. And so she said yes. And so Dave told Shirley about how he had discovered skydiving much the same way she had. And they really bonded over that. About 20 minutes after takeoff, all the tandem jumpers on the plane were now attached to their instructors. So Shirley was now buckled onto Dave. And then when they reached 13,500 feet, the jumping altitude, one of the instructors slid open the side door. It was time to jump. And the first one who was jumping was Shirley's son. And so from all the way back in the plane, Shirley called out to her son, have a good jump, I'll see you on the ground. As her son kind of waddled to the edge of the door with his instructor and the two of them jumped out and disappeared into the air below. Next up was Shirley. So Dave told Shirley very calmly to stand up. And so they did, they stood up right next to their bench. And then before they waddled towards the exit, Dave, for what felt like the millionth time, checked to make sure he really was securely fastened onto Shirley. And then Dave tapped his ripcord right behind him, kind of like muscle memory, reminding himself where to go. He tapped his knife on his shoulder. He kind of just felt his equipment and then feeling ready, he said, okay, Shirley, let's go. And then the two of them kind of waddled their way towards the front of the plane where that door was slid wide open and then they turned so Shirley's feet were right on the edge basically looking out into the sky right outside. 
And so it's really loud, it's very windy, and Dave is right in Shirley's ear saying, okay, I'm gonna count to three and we're gonna jump. And then Dave reached forward, he pulled Shirley's head back so she was looking up because he didn't want her to look down when they leapt out because for some people that will cause them to panic when they see the ground. And so with Shirley's head back, Dave very calmly said one, two, three, and then very gracefully, the two of them jumped out. From the moment you jump out of a plane at 13,500 feet until you touch the ground, it takes maybe two to three minutes with about 30 seconds to a minute of actual free fall. But that two to three minutes is so intense, it feels like it's 20 minutes long. And this was what Dave loved so much about skydiving, that intense presence you feel, that you're really in the moment. There's nothing else you can think about. It's just you careening through the sky towards the earth. It's incredible. Dave had actually had a number of close calls in his life. Like a few years earlier, he had been riding his motorcycle when somebody hit him in their car and he fractured his skull. And then not long after that accident, he was in another accident where he fractured his spine. And after each of those two accidents and a few others, the only thought in Dave's mind was, oh my goodness, I hope I can skydive again. And miraculously, he had been. He had made full recoveries and he was back to skydiving each time. And so now, whenever he jumped out of a plane, he just felt so lucky. The plan for that evening's jump was for Dave to rotate them 360 degrees three separate times so Shirley could get a full look down across Houston and all over Texas and just kind of see the world around her from so high up in the air. And then whenever Dave noticed that they were at 5,000 feet using his wrist altimeter, which is basically like a watch that tells you how far you are from the ground, Dave would pull the ripcord, the main chute would deploy, and they would float gently down to the ground. And at first, that is how this jump went. After they exited the plane, they stabilized in the proper horizontal position with Shirley in front, her stomach pointing toward the ground, and Dave obviously right behind her, controlling the skydive. And then after a few seconds, Dave slightly changed his body position and began rotating them 360 degrees so Shirley could look down and see all the highways and cars and barns and houses and the city off in the distance. I mean, it's this spectacular view. and as you're falling through the sky, especially in the first few seconds of a jump, you can't tell that you're going super fast, but you're going over 120 miles an hour, which is called terminal velocity. It's literally the fastest you can fall in the air. And so you're blazing towards the ground, but it almost feels like the air is pushing you back up. And so Shirley's having this incredible first time experience, just really taking it all in. And Dave, even though he had done this hundreds of times, was having a wonderful time as well, but Dave really was just focused on his altimeter because when they hit 5,000 feet, he needed to pull the parachute. And so they're cruising along, Dave's checking his altimeter over and over again. And then finally he sees 5,000 feet. He quickly looks around him to scan for any other jumpers. He's clear. And so he reached back and he pulled his ripcord handle for his main chute. Now, normally when you deploy your main parachute, depending on what kind of parachute you're using, there's actually kind of a slow unfurling. It's not like, suddenly the chute is deployed and then you just stop. That would not work. You'd get destroyed every time you skydive. So the way it's packed is it kind of unfurls slowly and it's like a gradual slowing down. But after Dave has pulled the ripcord handle, there was an immediate yank of the parachute backpack up and away from him. And then from somewhere above him, he heard a loud popping sound. Now, Dave had jumped enough times to know that this was not normal. There was a problem and he would be right. The main parachute had deployed out of the backpack, but it got tangled on the way out. And so it did not inflate at all. And so as a result, it was not slowing them down at all. But worse than that was this tangled up parachute was still attached to them and it kind of became like a sail. And it turned Dave and Shirley onto their sides and began whipping them around in something called a death spiral, where literally you're just spinning so unbelievably fast that Normally, jumpers will actually lose consciousness. They're spinning so fast. But Dave, being a very experienced skydiver, he tried to stay calm. He tried to track his way out of this death spiral, which is when you put your arms and legs straight and try to go in a straight line through the air, but it didn't work. He just kept on spinning faster and faster. And at this point, Shirley, she's practically losing consciousness. She's yelling what's going on. And Dave is just trying to stay calm. He's still trying to get out of it, but he knows there's no way. But Dave remembers he has two knives. And so he decides he's gonna cut away this tangled main chute 
and then deploy his reserve chute because you don't want to open your reserve directly into a tangled parachute. And so he reaches up, he's spinning, remember, he reaches up and he grabs the first knife. However, the lines of the tangled parachute had actually tangled on his shoulder strap where that first knife was. And so he literally couldn't get to the knife. And so now they're below 5,000 feet. They're at like 4,000, closing in on 3,000 feet. I mean, they're coming close to the ground here and they don't have a canopy. But Dave, he stays calm. They're spinning around. He can't get that first knife. And so he reaches for the second knife, which was placed in front of Shirley. But because of how quickly they were spinning, he couldn't quite get his arm out to grab the second knife. It was just impossible to grab it. And so without any other options, Dave had to pull his reserve chute, knowing it was going to go straight into this tangled mess right above them. And so the reserve chute, it deploys and it does work, at least at first. There's that gradual slowing down sensation that Dave immediately feels, their spin begins to stop. And for a second, it seems like they're going to be saved by this reserve chute, because by now they're only about 2000 feet from the ground. However, the worst case scenario happens to Dave and Shirley. As soon as their reserve chute was up over their head, inflated, their main chute suddenly caught air and inflated as well. So they had two parachutes. Now, you can land with two parachutes, absolutely. However, sometimes in a worst case scenario, the two parachutes will catch wind going in opposite directions. So basically the parachutes will go out to either side of the jumper or jumpers if it's tandem. And then you basically have wings that aim the jumpers straight at the ground. It's like an accelerant. It causes them to literally speed up straight towards the ground. And once you start moving in this position, which is known as a down plane, it's almost impossible to get out of it because the fast you go, the more inflated these two parachutes become. And so Dave knows they are less than 2,000 feet from the ground. They're in a down plane, which is almost always fatal. And so all he can do is try to get out of the down plane. And so Dave, with all his might, he begins yanking on the different lines of both parachutes and he manages to get them out of the down plane, which is nearly impossible to do. He does it. And then both parachutes collapse. And suddenly, Dave and Shirley have no parachute, they're less than a thousand feet from the ground, and they are falling once again over 100 miles per hour straight down to the earth. Now, at this moment, Shirley is crying, she's screaming, she doesn't know what's going on, and Dave has this incredible sense of calm come over him. Years ago, Dave had given up on the idea of ever having a family or of having kids. He was a really good guy who would have been a great father, but it just wasn't in the cards for him. Instead, Dave had found skydiving. Oftentimes, Dave would stay late at Skydive Houston and just sit around the campfire with the other instructors and the other jumpers and drink beers and eat burgers and tell stories. And sometimes Dave would even sleep the night at Skydive Houston because he didn't want to go back home to his empty three bedroom house where all he wanted to do when he was there was go skydiving again. But now, literally staring down his own death, knowing that it's gonna happen any second, the only thing he could think about was Shirley. He didn't care if he died. He felt like he had found his calling. If he died doing it, so be it. But Shirley, her husband, her son on the ground, her son skydiving, her three grandkids, they're gonna see Shirley hit the ground and die. He just couldn't handle it. He thought, I have to do something to protect Shirley. And with only a few hundred feet to the ground, Dave yelled to Shirley, tuck your knees up. And Shirley immediately did it. She threw her knees up. And as she did, Dave pulled back as hard as he possibly could on the risers and the toggles in an attempt to switch places with Shirley. Shirley was in front of him. Her body's going to hit the ground first. Dave flipped them around so that his back was going to hit the ground first. He was going to sacrifice himself to maybe save Shirley. When they hit the ground, people a quarter mile away heard their impact. And when they hit the ground, all of Shirley's family saw it. Everybody saw it. They went running over to the crash site. And when they got there, there was this tangle of bodies and this parachute. And as they're staring at it, they watched one of the bodies move. It was Shirley. She was alive. After paramedics arrived, they cut her off of Dave's body and they rushed her to the hospital where she had serious injuries. She had several broken vertebrae and very significant internal injuries, but none of them were life-threatening. She would survive. 
However, three days after arriving in the hospital, Shirley got devastating news. Dave had been rushed to the hospital as well right after Shirley had, but he finally had succumbed to his injuries and passed away. Dave's last ditch maneuver had worked. He had saved Shirley's life at the cost of his own. However, not long after Shirley and her family found out about Dave's death, they got another call, and this time it was to tell them that the news about Dave's death was premature. He was not dead. However, he was paralyzed from the neck down. A few weeks later, after Shirley got out of the hospital, she immediately went to the intensive care unit where Dave was being treated to see him for the first time since their accident. And when she saw him, he was sitting in a wheelchair covered in tubes and wires, and she just stood there looking at him. And Dave, when he saw Shirley, he just started to cry. At this point, Shirley walked up to him, she gave him a hug, and she said, I love you. Today, Dave and Shirley are still friends. Shirley has recovered completely because of Dave's heroic act. Dave, on the other hand, remains paralyzed and only has a little bit of feeling in his right arm. He now lives in Texas with his mother, who looks after him full time, and they desperately need our support. My family has already made a donation to his GoFundMe page, and I hope some of you will do the same thing. You can find his GoFundMe page in the description below. And after speaking with him, he assured me that all of the donation money is being used to take care of himself. He has a lot of care that he needs. His mom can't do it alone. And so anything we give them is just making his life a little bit easier. So that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please sneak into the like button's house and replace their cat with an identical looking cat. In the ochtend zon, het gras zo groen, de vogels zingen een melodie. De bergen rijzen zo krachtig en groot. De rivieren stromen wild en vrij. Oh, natuur, jouw kracht zo puur. Stop.